Hey folks, this is Jim here with Science Talk. And I want to share with you something that showed up in the Irish Times. And it came across in my Twitter feed. And it's very, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And uh, it shows a yet another problem that we all have to deal with when dealing with plastics. Aside from the fact that Plastics get into our food system, which means we ingest it. We have it in our uh, our bodies. I've made numerous videos discussing these issues, including recent studies showing that uh, we have plastics flowing in our blood, at least, as well as in other uh, organs. So here it's another little problem: plastics eaten by plankton may impair ocean's ability to trap CO2. Now, as we go through this quick little article, I think a better word would have been to sequester CO2. Oceans store up to half of all carbon dioxide produced by mankind in the last 200 years. Now we're going to show a nice little photo here. It's called a salp. S-A-L-P. It's a jellyfish-like species. This is a zooplankton. And they also form like these flowing chains, communities. Pretty, pretty wild. They bring CO2 to the ocean floor where it is stored. Hence why I think sequester is a better word to use in the headline. Microscopic pieces of plastic consumed by plankton in the world's ocean could be affecting the marine organism's ability to capture carbon dioxide. Oceans have stored up to half of all CO2 produced by mankind in the last two centuries, and it is stored at the bottom of the sea, according to marine scientists from the Ryan Institute at NUI Galway. On the sea surface, Microscopic algae turn uh, dissolve CO2 into fuel known as organic carbon, and these algae are consumed by many different animals, forming the basis of the marine food web. Right? We know that you know photosynthesis, CO2. You make uh, basic uh, uh, carbohydrates, simple uh, sugars. That's what the phytoplanktons do. They increase their biomass. Zooplankton graze them down, and then we have. Bigger things eat the zooplankton, and away we go. Now, before we go any further, I just want to show you this. I'm not, it's a six-minute long video, so I'm not going to show you the whole thing. I'll show you some highlights of it. But it's kind of a cool thing here. You know, if you want to see the video in full, just go to Irish Times and, you know, type into, into the search. Um, looking for the carbon. So here we go. This is the chain of these salps. You can kind of see it right here. And it's a, it's a pretty wild. I mean, these are, this is like a big colonial group of organisms. These are all individual organisms making up this chain. You can notice there's a bit of a helical aspect to their formation. And this thing, you know, this is really long. <laughs> I mean, how many uh, tens of meters is this thing? Yeah, let me pick another spot here to take a look. But I think you get an idea for, you know, this is pretty uh, remarkable. Uh, let's just say nature is always full of surprises. 
So uh, it gives you an idea of, you know, what these uh, will do. And don't forget, uh, among, you know, jellyfish are, are part of the Cilentorata uh, uh, phyla, phylum, singular, that uh, are known to form colonial uh, uh, aggregations here. So it's not really, when you think of it in, in understanding of that terms, it's not, it's not a surprise. So, continuing on, passing through the food chain, much of the organic carbon is released, converted back into CO2. Some is released into the ocean and the atmosphere. More of it is transported to the seafloor by salps, these jelly-like fish, bringing it to the bottom where it is sequestered. And it's, and it's not just the salp. It's a whole bunch of, you know, marine organisms. Uh, and I just, you know, we call it marine snow. I described that for you before in the past, but this is just yet another mechanism to sequester the carbon. However, microscopic pieces of plastic, of waste plastics, are interfering with the chain. Right? Interfering with the chain. According to the NUIG research carried out together with scientists at UCC, in Villa uh, France sur Mer, a laboratory in France. And here's the, a picture of the, uh, the principal investigator, Alina uh, Wissorek. He goes, our study suggests salp fecal pellets will remain at the sea surface for longer when they contain microplastics. And obviously has a little bit of a specimen jar here. Here's a little photo of a close-up. And they self play a pivotal role in removing CO2 from the surface of the world's oceans. So salps ingest the algae at the sea surface, produce dense fecal pellets, which rapidly sink to the deep sea, carrying with them some of this captured carbon, uh, Alina uh, Wieslerweck uh, explains. Experiments in, uh, in the Villafront found that when the salps ingest microplastics and incorporate them into the fecal pellet, they did not sink as fast, according to research published in the journal Environmental Science and Technology. Our study suggests salp fecal pellets will remain at the sea surface for longer when they contain the microplastics, and while there, they may get broken down, causing the CO2 to be released back into the ocean, an atmosphere said, well, I don't know why the same is, it's, it's, it should be doctor, uh, weeks of wreck. This means microplastics have the potential to lower the efficiency of one of the most important natural processes occurring within our oceans, the biologically driven transport of CO2 to the sea floor. Okay, let's highlight that. This is important. Microplastics have the potential to lower the efficiency. This is talking about the biological pump to sequester CO2 to the seafloor. So if they linger longer, that means the CO2 has a chance to stay in the upper oceans, possibly making their way, being outgassed back into the atmosphere as opposed to being brought to the sediments. Now, my guess would be that the microplastics most likely uh, affects the buoyancy. Right? So, as I said here, is the, the fecal pellets are not as dense, so won't sink as rapidly. So that's probably what's happening. It's affecting the, the buoyancy, changing the density, making it lighter. Therefore, giving a chance for the CO2 to be acted upon and then it stays in the upper ocean and goes makes its way back in the atmosphere versus sinking. Dr. Tom Doyle, UCC, said the laboratory work highlights marine litter and microplastics may affect anim animals and even ecosystems in ways not yet considered. However, it's very important to point out a study was carried in the laboratory. We now, the next step is to go out into the field to test the hypothesis by quantifying the abundance 
of microplastics found on salps and their fecal pellets in different areas of the oceans. And we all know the CO2, uh, what it does, changing, causing the climate to warm, etc. While alterations in the density of salp fecal pellets may cause some of them to be recycled in upper waters, some may still reach the seafloor and transport the microplastics within them to the deep sea. Evidence to support this was confirmed in the Mariana Trench, the deepest point on Earth located in the Pacific Ocean. Plastics have been found everywhere in the world's ocean, from the Arctic Ocean to the Mariana Trench. So even if that's, you know, if this is, you know, what, what they're saying, that they could still reach, you know, the Mariana Trench, for example, may not uh, reach it in the amounts, in the quantities that would have been were it not for the microplastics being incorporated. So here is yet another example how, you know, humans are really mucking things up. That we have, you know, all this plastics, which is, you know, don't forget, plastics are a product of fossil fuels. That's where it comes from. And we're now interfering with the efficiency of the sequestering carbon to the ocean depths. Yet another example of what we are doing to the planet. Until next time, thank you for your time.